external God in heaven. I plead on behalf of every individual present in this house of prayer. You have come to be filled, Lord, with the bread of life. Pray that you will not let us go empty from here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. You should never go tired, grow tired of saying happy Sabbath to this day. And we must have said this a few times. But indeed it's a happy Sabbath. Simply because the Lord has blessed the Sabbath. And His presence is in the Sabbath and is inviting us into the Sabbath. Because He's already there in the Sabbath. I want to thank God for giving me this privilege to speak on His behalf to His people and His time. It's my, it's my humble desire that each of us will keep me in your prayers while I preach this message and that you will individually look at ways how this message applies to you. Not your family, not your children, individually to you. And for the children, see how this message will individually apply to you. So, okay, because unless it applies to me, nothing can change. Because the change starts from me. This week has been a very mixed week for me personally. When I heard of my mother uh, going for the surgery, and uh, the doctor said that she was brought just in the nick of time. She has been suffering with this severe knee problem for many years. And every time I wish to win her, the first thing she'll say is, there's a lot of pain in my knee and I'm so pain. We tried various medications and trying to work in a way where we could avoid the surgery. I even spoke to Anthony and he mentioned some herbal medications and we tried to get that way to work out. And eventually it came to a point the surgery was unavoidable. So she had the surgery in Sulit Hospital from a doctor who was apparently visits every twice in a year from Germany and does knee replacement surgeries. So both her knees have been replaced. She's recovering well and faces are on. I thank the church for keeping her in your prayers. Uh, and please continue to pray for her. She's still weak and in a lot of agony. I just hope that she'll come out of surgery without having to take too take many medications. And uh, on a witness, uh, we have my wife Diamond, she was in a very serious incident uh, a week ago. And if it was not for the Lord's intervention, things would have been very different with her when someone had almost attacked her in the car uh, while she was about to move from the car and trying to leave. And the car just locked itself from inside so the person could not get it. I gave this testimony in the church, uh, in the South Manchester church, and some of you probably missed it. I'm just mentioning this again that the Lord has intervened, saved her, the angels have guarded her and she was safe home. While I was not there, I was in the office, I was hearing the interaction on the phone of what was happening in the car and I couldn't help but only advise her and try to keep her calm. But indeed, indeed, it was God who helped us. And I thank you and I thank God very much. I want to thank God for making it possible for this week of prayer which took place for the past two weeks. It has been an amazing blessing. For me personally, uh, for two solid weeks, every single day has been a blessing. And the Lord has chosen the speakers who came there and delivered the message. God is mighty. He speaks to His people at the right time to change hearts so that we can, that we can prepare our hearts to receive Him because it's soon coming. And the week of prayer has been a massive blessing. Hopefully, it's been to some of you who are able to make it, if not for all the sessions, for some of the sessions. And uh, indeed, God has been good to us. I want to thank, uh, I want to thank Simran. I don't want to take all the credit, but the slides that you will see. You know, Simran was on the way today, and I will try to put them together on the PowerPoint. And without me taking the undue credit, I want to thank Simran for putting that together for me. I will have, you have a prayer now before. Father, 
<laughs> this is your time. And you have chosen me. A weak, sinful, and wretched sinner to bring this message to your people. I humble myself before you, Lord. Please use me. So that every word that comes out of my mouth, every thought that crosses my mind at this moment, you will guard it, you will keep it. And only that which your people need to hear will flow out of my mouth. May every person who's come here be filled with the message that you wanted to hear and leave this place having made that decision to transform their lives to walk closer with you because your coming is even at the door in Jesus' name. On 13th of November, if you've been following the news, and I try and follow the news to keep in, keep in touch with what's happening around. I know there is sometimes propaganda, there are things happening which are inflamed by the journalists. But I mean, just gives us an idea of what's happening in the world around us today. Because you do not want to live in a cocoon, not knowing what's around, what's happening around you. So while I was following this news on 30th of November, uh, at around 9.20 p.m., Paris suffered one of the deadliest atrocities which was said to be one of the worst since the World War II uh, when the attacks took place by six teams of gunmen who stormed in various places and there were suicide bom bombers and it was a coordinated attack in Paris leaving almost 130 people dead and more than 350 people injured while well, one of my trip uh, to my office every morning, I used the bus uh, going to Trafford. I was I picked the newspaper when I was reading. I came across this little article, and it kind of took me uh, by shock to know how children also reacted to this particular incident. It was in the Metro newspaper earlier this week, and this is what it said: "Scared children call the hotline, asking, is this World War III?" The NSPCC, which is a charity organization, received many calls. The child line has received an avalanche of calls from youngsters shaken by the Paris terror attacks. The charity has taken more than 100 calls from children as young as 9 who told counselors they were afraid they would be victims of an atrocity on British shows. Now these are British children talking to uh, the British charity. Some said they were struggling to think of anything else and were frightened to leave the house, while others feared the planet was on the brink of World War II. Now, these are children as young as nine, calling up by themselves, calling up the charity, and they're scared, they're frightened. Fear and turmoil in the hearts of children, let alone adults. <coughs> on 31st October, at 6.40 a.m., the Russian airline Metrojet lost contact with the control room and crashed in the Sinai Desert after descending from 33,000 feet, killing 224 passengers' crew on board. The dead were mostly Russian citizens, men and women, children touring Egypt and returning back from their trip. Never did any of them in their wildest dream could have thought that that particular journey was their past. Never did any of these people who have died in these atrocities in Paris or in the Russian era thought that they would never have a chance to repent and that probation had come to them. Because once you are dead, the next thing you know is when Jesus comes. So this is a serious warning to people who are alive, walking alive around us, things happening. It's a reminder to connect ourselves to God. Europe is struggling to handle the largest flow of migrants since the aftermath of World War II. Four million civilians have fled the war from the city of Syria. Tens of thousands are dying daily 
due to hunger, war, disease, and overloaded boats, ferries used to transport asylum seekers and refugees. And these are done by smugglers who have their personal gains. Of course, they're trying to show a better future and hope for these people. But many of them die in the transport. Major world events are taking place around us almost daily, every day. Making the abnormal things that was maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, these things are just abnormal, making it look normal. Drastically affecting the lives of people in communities and countries, in societies, and people in the neighborhood. The other day I was in the office and we were seated and I was working. I think it was on Thursday this week. <coughs> and uh, we had this, it's, it's a new building and the steps has got glass panels on the side. While we were working around about 3 o'clock, suddenly we heard a loud bang, like a crash. And guess what? This Paris attack, all these things people are hearing in the news, it's fresh in people's mind. Everybody just jumped. So what's happened? Is there a bomb blast or something? So we ran in the direction of where the sound was coming from. When we went, we saw in the staircase, for some strange reason, for apparent no reason, no one touched it, a massive glass panel just fell on the floor. It was really big, it was literally maybe three to four feet wide, I mean, you know, like massive glass panel just fell from the stairs. Fortunately, there, were no, there was nobody around who was injured. And people were, some of them were little shivering, one lady was holding her face and just thinking, what's happening? Fear. Fear in the eyes and the hearts of people every day. We are walking. In recent times, papacy has gained much more popularity. Now some of the things I will be sharing, probably some of you may already know, some of you know a little more, and some of you may not know. But those of you who already know, I believe repetition creates impression, so it will help you anyway. And those who do not know, hopefully this will be a revelation for you to help you take stock of where you are in your life with God. APC has gained more popularity and power among the masses, where Catholics and non-Catholics have begun to appreciate and follow the Pope very closely. They have developed a liking and a favor towards the Pope. The recent visit of Pope addressing both the House of Congress was a giant step forward in the fulfillment of the prophecy. Testimonies for Christ, page 5, uh, page 5, 451, Bible says this. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp the hands of spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a protestant and republican government and shall make provisions for the propagation of false uh, propagation of papal falsehood and delusions then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of satan and the end is near ellen g white has given this prophecy and it has fulfilled in front of us friends and brethren, it's not my intention to condemn any individual person or any individual who may be part of this particular battle. But we need to be clear that it's an authority, that it's a system which is putting things together for the final battle. Final battle with God's people. And this particular system has also changed the Sabbath. They have changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And here is something that should interest us to know. T. N. Wright, in a lecture at the Hartford, Kansas, in February 18, 1844, says this I repeatedly offered dollars 1000 to anyone who can prove to me from the Bible alone that I am bound to keep Sunday holy. There is no such law in the Bible, it is the law of the Holy Catholic Church alone. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Catholic Church says, no. By my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in a reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. So, this is an admission by a lecturer and he is apparently a priest as well. 
can cancel. <coughs> James Cardinal Gibbons, the fame of our fathers, 88th edition, 889. But you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you will find not, not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scripture enforces the religious observance of Saturday, a day which is never sanctified. And so it's an admission made by the Catholics of day changing the Sabbath. You and I cannot do otherwise. We need to warn the people around us. And I try and do that in my way. I do it through WhatsApp messages. I send these messages even to Catholic friends. And I'm sure God in His time will work in their hearts. Revelation chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of the prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And truly, the time is at hand. The Bible clearly warns, which warns in Luke chapter 17 verse 26 to 28, which was our scripture reading. And it goes, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. Verse 27, They did eat, they drank, they married, wives, they were, they were given in marriages until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Verse 28, Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built it. The prophecy is very clear and it's fulfilling before our very eyes. In Noah's days, what happened? Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 and 11 to 12 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was so great in the earth that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. There was no break. Continually it's evil. The earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth and behold it was corrupt. For all flesh was corrupted in a way upon the earth. All flesh was corrupted. In Lord's day what happened? Jude chapter 1 verse 7 says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal life. So what are we expecting in the time that we live in? Noah's days, not today. Are these things happening around us today? So what happened in the Noah's days? The earth in Noah's days was full of people who rejected God and they walked after their own flesh, served their own interests. And the earth was full of violence. And what about Lord's day in Sodom? God's word says that people in Sodom had given themselves over to sexual fornication and strange flesh. With homosexuality being all around. So Jesus is saying that the world in the end times would mirror what it was like in the days of Noah and in the days of Lord. Do we see that happening around us today in the world? Do we hear what this happened? Do we see rights and laws being passed to fulfill this? To meet this? Absolutely yes. I'm sure each one of us will agree with me. Not only do we live in a world full of violence, sexual immorality, including homosexuality, these things have become a norm and violence has become an entertainment. The world is being entertained by homosexuality and war and, and uh, violence and criminal activities. The very reason that God destroyed the world for him in the time of Sodom and in the time of Noah. Since 2001 to now, more, more countries have been added to the list who have legalized homosexuality in their country. It's legal. You cannot talk about it. You cannot object it. You have to accept it. Because you cannot go against the law. Countries like Argentina, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, Iceland, Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, Spain, South Africa, United Kingdom, Sweden, New Zealand, Europe, France, North America, South America, all these countries, these are massive big countries and these are literally covering continents, have accepted as a law homosexuality. London has got the largest LGBT community in the world. Our city, Manchester, I used to work in Manchester City Council Center back. And every year there is a Manchester Pride Day which celebrates in Manchester. And an email goes to everybody. They, they want volunteers to come and support it, to be volunteers. And I used to be volunteer for I was volunteer Commonwealth Games and all of these. So I used to get those emails, do you want to become a volunteer? 
and I knew what's happening. Homosexuality is soaring and has become a norm. The fashion statement with celebrities and politicians and religious people around us. I was reading a newspaper and uh, I came across, I'm not sure if you heard of Tom Daly, the very famous diver. He's a British diver. He's world famous, he's very young. And as we had man so young, you know, and he was amazing. Diving skills. He came, I think, second or third in Olympics. The China got up to the first place. And he was just kind of pursuing that. And then I heard that he has declared himself as a homosexual. What do you think his fans are thinking about? They're thinking of embracing that. Celebrities proudly say that. And then you find parents proud saying in the, in the newspaper that declaring that I'm glad my son has made that decision. I'm glad my child has made that decision. And is willing to be bold about it. Young Evelyn Glennie, graduate from London's prestigious Royal Academy of Music, became a percussionist, much against medical science. For Evelyn, the beats, the shakes, the rattles of squeezes, more than 600 musical instruments, from drums to marimbos to xylophones, cymbals, tambourines, violins, guitars, and every other string instrument. As the world's only full-time percussion soloist, Soloist. She was given the title of DBE, Day of British Empire, and a title of OBE, Officer of British Empire. Evelyn made history when she gave her first solo percussion performance and recital in, in 95 years of BBC's permanent concert at Royal Albert Hall, and also in the Kennedy Center in USA. These are one of the massive halls where people of elite class go to these particular halls. But the wild applause of people who gave, uh, who heard her presentation did not fall on her ears because she was deaf. She was deaf from her early years. Evelyn Glenny had been unable to hear at all. She learned to feel the notes and the musical notes, the scales, by placing her hand on the outside wall of a music room as a teacher struck the note inside the room. So she could just feel the notes on the wall. The variation in the tingling vibrations is so how she identified the notes. She now masters the entire scores of complex music by playing a tape recorder between her knees. Her autobiography appropriately calls her book as Good Vibrations. A deaf woman. I didn't know there were 600 instruments, probably there could be, but when I heard the brothers, she knew them, and she's deaf. Why am I saying that? I'm not sure if John the Revelator looks something like this, but at least gives an idea of John the Revelator in the Isle of Patmos. For the time is near. Even in John's days, the vibrations of the apocalyptic fulfillment could be felt in the fingertips of those discerning hearts and minds that are open to the revelations of the prophetic council. And now you and I, living more than 2,000 years after John's handwritten parchment, and compelling reality for all who read the Apocalypse is that the same Christ who spoke to the lonely prophet in the banished island of Patmos speaks with the spirits to you and me. It's with the spirit to you and me. To every reader who comes across to the book of Revelation, it reveals Jesus Christ to you and me. Yes, you and I have to open those pages of Revelation and read what is there for us. For the time is near. Vibrations unique to this hour of the earth's history now tremble throughout the earth. It is so good reality that we are living so close to the return of Christ that any other generation has ever lived. We are that close. However, the warning is given to us in Matthew chapter 24 verse 24. For there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, and shall shew great signs and wooden and wonders, in so much that if they are possible, the very elect shall be deceived. <coughs> now the interesting thing is, while I was doing this, uh, preparing material for my message, I was reading and doing some research. 
I came across this interesting article and note, and it said this: We aren't the only ones waiting for a savior and a Lord and a God to come. A news clipping in India said, India awaits Vishnu's return. Hindus believe that we are living in the last age and that Vishnu, a member of the Hindu trinity, will return to this earth. So we have company. With believers in different faith, waiting for an event. A small talk with any Muslim person will, come, will bring to your knowledge that even the Muslims know that Jesus is coming. And the Quran says it. But it's for a different reason. The Jews too are waiting for Messiah's coming. One ultra-Orthodox Jewish sect in Israel, in Israel notes that the Talmudic sages predicted that the Messiah's coming would be preceded by great chaos and confusion. And thus his coming must be near. This is what they conclude. Even the Jains and the Zoroastrians were expecting their cause. Are expecting their cause. Now let me be candid, let me be very clear to make this point. It doesn't take us to have doctorate in theology or have some great knowledge to understand that Lucifer has masterfully made his overmastering delusion that more potent deception is suddenly coming upon us with many people expecting the coming of the Savior. And Satan is preparing the whole world to become an angel of light that he will suddenly come and show himself as angel of light. And the sick humanity will say, oh, here is my Savior who is come. What does Great Conversion say in page 6 to 4? His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle compassion, towards he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths that Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people. And then in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. This is a strong, almost overmastering division. Page 625 says, Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures, who have received love of the truth, will be shielded from the powerful division that takes place, takes the world captive. The true knowledge of the world. What will that take? That will take a sincere study, personal study of the scriptures, of this time prophecy and how it applies to the time that we are living in. Our hope must be informed, intelligent, and based upon the bedrock knowledge of the Bible and Bible alone. The news is bad that all these things are happening around us and people are being deceived. <coughs> but on the other front, the news is good because we know Jesus is coming soon. Prophecies are being fulfilled. However, let me not miss mentioning this one of the divisions which has been brought about by Christians and certain people with their own agendas. The Secret Rapture. It's a popular left behind series. It's come from a novel that made fortune selling the idea that Jesus comes back to earth and he will do so secretly, quietly like a thief in the night. The novel talks about a 747 pilot who rushes home to Chicago from where is the water transatlantic flight where the passengers mysteriously disappeared 35,000 feet above. And now the pilot coming to his home finds beneath the bed covers his wife's nightie. He finds his wife's necklace, his wife's clothes and things and his wife is not there. Secretly raptured by Jesus. And now he's distraught, he's sad that he's been left behind. Is that the way Jesus thought that he would be coming? Is that the way Jesus said he would come one day and take his faithful home? Matthew chapter 24 verse 23 to 26 says this. Jesus is warning of stark, Jesus is warning is stark and clear to you and me. If anyone tells you that I come secretly, do not believe it. Now what can be more clear than do not believe it? In verse 27, Jesus declares how the second coming will be. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Nobody will wake up the next day morning and wish that he hadn't slept through Christ's return. It won't happen. Everybody will come to him. The theory of secret rapture has come because Jesus likened his return as a thief in the night. But that was not Jesus' point. The very next 
word thereof is also to be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. So the effectiveness of a thief is not that he is coming silently or he is secretly, but his unexpectedness of when he is coming. The great deception that people will fall into this world and its affairs will seem business as usual. You go every day, you hear this news. Here is a bomb blast, there is an attack, there are things happening. And you think it's business as usual. It masks the sober reality that we have before our eyes. The Jesus is even at the door. And unlike the secret rapture theory, those who are left behind are not left behind to be given a second chance. That's not Jesus' intention. Those who are left behind are left behind. They have lost eternity. And Jesus takes his people home. Testaments for the Church, Volume 9, page 11 says, We are living in a time of end. The fast fulfilling signs of the times declare that the coming of Christ is near at hand. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. Plagues and judgments are already falling upon the despises and the grace of uh, and judgments are falling on the despises and the grace of God. The calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of society, the alarm of war are portentous. They forecast approaching events with greatest magnitude. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They were strengthening for the last great crisis. The great changes are soon taking place in our world. And the final moments are going to be rapid ones. They are not going to be slow. They are going to move very swiftly. And guess what? You won't have time then to prepare yourself because the changes will be too fast. The time to change and time to transform our lives and to commit our lives to God is now. And I plead before the church to take stock of where we are. Where you are, where your family is, where you are individually in terms of your spiritual life. Finally, I'm going to close with a story that happened in a town in India. On a hot summer day, on a dry, a dry leaf of coconut tree, it caught fire. The fire was so great that it quickly destroyed the vegetation of the farm. It destroyed the coconut trees, the farmer's vegetation, and some of the huts around and things were looking quite bleak and dangerous. So an SOS call was made for the fire engine. The fire engine came and started to put the fire, the fire off. When the investigation was done, they tried to find out how did this fire take place in this, uh, in this beautiful uh, village, in this beautiful farm, farm place. And they found that a crow had taken in its beak a string, a small rope, which had a glow on one side. It had fire on one side. Thinking that it was taking material to build its nest. And then they found how did this crow get this particular string? And they found out that there was a particular shop that was selling cigarettes. And when they keep a lighter, instead of keeping giving them lighter or matchstick which costs money, they put a string with fire on one side. So while the string keeps going, people who buy cigarettes can light their cigarettes there <laughs> and smoke. And this crow, innocent, didn't see the light on one side, picked up the string, flew to its nest. <coughs> what it did? It burnt its own house. It burnt its own house. Probably there were more nests around. It must have burnt those as well. Many times we make wrong choices in choosing the ingredients to build our homes and our families. Choices like indulging in worldly entertainment, television, internet, YouTube, Facebook. These are the choices we are facing every time. When I was in India in those days, these were, I mean, electronics and things were not so common. So we were most busy playing football or, you know, maybe spending time, even those are not as great uh, time, place to spend time, but we did those. But today, it's everywhere, Xbox and video games, mobiles, and all sorts of electronics, worldly music. 
choices to eat raw unhealthy food and we sacrifice our family time our prayer time with your family for these things we spend time gossiping sometimes we spend time talking to each other about things which are not healthy things which don't build you do things that doesn't build the church which doesn't build a family which doesn't help you doesn't bless you in your eternity doesn't prepare you you spend time doing such such, such of these things what are these things doing these things are like the string with fire on one side it's going to come and build your uh, burn your own house it's going to burn your own house burn your church burn your community it's going to bring the fire there your children are depending upon you Sometimes we don't make the choice. Sometimes we say, "Okay, I'm not part of these things. I'm not part of the electronic. I'm not part of these uh, gossips." Okay, but sometimes when you just refrain and don't make the right choice to do the right things, just by refraining and not doing anything whatsoever, you're still part of doing the wrong thing. You can either be on good side or you can be on the bad side. There's no neutral ground. God has called us to make the right choice and then lead by example for your children, for your church, for your communities, for people around you. Living at the end of Earth's history, we must be good stewards of our time. The Lord will ask you account of the time you spend. He's given you 65, 70, 80. Hopefully, all of us sitting here will live your 100 years. He'll ask you account of those time. What did you do for the 100 years I gave you? We do not have time to waste. The time is close at hand. And God forbid that any one of our provisions are closed before our before our earnest. Heartfelt repentance to God. Our provisions can close any time. If tomorrow I go from here to my house and on the way I don't reach home due to your car crash or something, that's it. I don't have time to repent. It's serious. And you know, we do not want to wake up when the final call comes. They're going to, you were not supposed to be in the first resurrection, you're supposed to be in the second. We have come quite far in our Christian walk. You and me have come quite far in our Christian walk. Let's not keep it away. Let's take stock, see where we are, and make those changes in our lives so that we can better our own lives, our family's lives, and prepare ourselves for the Lord's return. Because when the time comes, as I said, it's going to be rapid and you cannot make any decisions then or start making changes and start you know, instant those changes in, in your children because they've already seen it all. And it's too quick for them. These are the phases, page 600 says, Christ is coming with clouds and with great glory. A multitude of shining angels will attend him. He will come to raise the dead and to change the living saints from glory to glory. He will come to honor those who have loved him and kept his commandments and to take them to himself. He has not forgotten them nor his promise. There will be a relinking of family chain. A little longer. And we shall see the king in his beauty a little longer and he will wipe all tears from our eyes a little longer and he will present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. We are fast approaching for the close of time. Let every soul that is within this church in hearing distance of what I say inquire, inquire about yourself. How do I stand before God? We know not how soon our names will be taken into the lips of Christ and our courses and our cases will be finally decided. What or what will be the decision then? Shall we be counted among the righteous or shall we be numbered among the wicked? Hebrews chapter 10 verse 37 says, and it's very encouraging for me when I, get, when I read this verse. Yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not die. The final part of my message will be brought to you in the song by Simon. Now this message this song is one of my favorite songs. They're one of, one of the songs that I always found, I always sing, and I want the church to pray. Pray about the words that you hear from this song. Pray that these words will make a change in your life and help you reconnect.
humble yourselves before the Lord. Years of time have come and gone. Since that first 32, how Jesus will come again someday. If back then it was so real, how much more it is now? The redemption is drawing now. Question one. To every person who can hear my voice in this house to pray. To think again of the way we are living our lives every day. To prepare our hearts every single day. Right from morning to night. Take time to pray, to read the scriptures. To do that which the Lord has called us to do. We are not just here because we exist. We are here for a purpose and we are here to receive the Lord because He's coming soon. May God bless us. So loving and merciful. You made a covenant with us and coming again to take us. You've given us signs to prepare our hearts. Help us, Lord. Like the tribe of Isaacal to, to know the times of living in, to prepare our hearts, our families, our children, our church, our community. <coughs> Give us strength and pray, give us the wisdom to understand. May we not be slumbering, may we not be sleeping through this time, Lord. Because we could be like the foolish virgins, <coughs> missing in the Bible comes to take. Help us and pray, Lord. I plead on behalf of every single soul, children, youth, adults and parents. I pray on behalf of every single one. Help us, Lord, in daily walk, to walk close with you. Help us to prepare our hearts and may we be found in eternal kingdom in Jesus.